we're back into our last week looking at the creeds. We don't have a creed today. We've done the three main creeds. But because there were so many questions that came out from the creeds, and one in particular, one question that came up, or not even a question, but one, one hesit- hesitation. I don't mean the Catholic bit. That was a hesitation which we dealt with already. Um, but, but primarily concerning the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit in each of the three creeds that we've looked at features, but not, not prominently because the Holy Spirit wasn't one of the, or wasn't featured heavily in one of the um, heresies that these creeds were established to kind of bring clarity into. And so today, my hope is we'll, have, we'll spend a little bit of time looking, again, primarily at the Holy Spirit. Before we do, I just want to kind of situate us. Imagine for you and for, and for me, but in your life, uh, Jesus, like the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, uh, you know, in physical form as he walked on the earth, walking with you over a couple of years. So everywhere you go, he's there. Uh, every question you have, he's there. He might answer in parables, but he's still, still there to give you an answer. You have tough decisions to make, he's right there. You can ask him and he can give you exactly godly wisdom that you can hear. Uh, joyful times, he's there. Tough times, he's there. When he got sick, he's there. Say, oh, Jesus, I am sick. Would you please heal me? You can take care of it. When you're discouraged, Jesus is there. He's right there with you. And you live like this for a couple of years. And then after a couple of years, Jesus comes to you and he says, what a wonderful couple of years. I'm going now. I'm, out, I'm, I'm leaving you. And it's better for you that I do. Because this is exactly what happened for the first disciples who walked with Jesus. He walked, he called them out of their lives, whatever they were doing, they, they dropped their life, came and walked with Jesus. They were there <clears throat> through very good times, through very difficult times, when people were trying to attack and kill Jesus, when there were you know, winds uh, and they're in this precarious position out on a little boat, but winds are coming up. And in every situation, they're like, Jesus, do you see the winds? And he says, be still winds. And the winds come down and they're like, holy moly. This is amazing. Or, or Jesus is preaching and he tells them parables to the crowds. And afterwards they're like, hey, Jesus, we still don't get it. And he says, let me tell you. The, se- the keys to the secrets of the kingdom have been given to you. Let me explain the parable. Oh my goodness. And then he comes to me and he says, and now I'm going, <laughs> now I'm going. And you hear, you hear Peter's reaction. He's like, no way, forbid it. But Jesus says, it's better for you that I go. It's better that I go. It's recorded in John 16. He says, yet because I've spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. He's like, I told you that I'm leaving. That's not going to be easy but it's better that I go. He says, nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he'll convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He'll also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes what is mine and will declare it to you. This is astounding, what Jesus is saying. To God himself, the the long-awaited Messiah, the whole Old Testament, all of the prophets foreshadowing, foretelling, or, or typifying God who was to come. Emmanuel, God will come and dwell with us and he's here. And even Jesus says, who do you guys say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You're the one from God. You're the one we're waiting for. 
You're here. And Jesus says, you didn't come up with this on your own. This has been revealed to you because you are prophetically stating a truth you couldn't have otherwise known. Everything that's been written has been written about me and here I am and I've come. And even later they say, you know, is now the time you're gonna establish your kingdom on here on earth? We've been waiting for you to come. We've been waiting for you to save us. We've been waiting and now you're here and now you're telling us you're gonna go. And he says, I tell you the truth. It is to your benefit that I go. I've got to go. If I don't come, the Holy Spirit won't come. But if I go, I'm going to send him to you. It's astounding. We tend to, as Christians, we tend to lean or fall into a ditch, really, on one of two sides. We either highlight the Holy Spirit. And even uh, we looked at when Daniel preached about um, the Athanasian Creed, uh, which was speaking against this heresy of modalism that God in the Old Testament was God the Father and God in the New Testament, he shows himself as the Son, but now he's just God the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and so many kind of fall into that trap or something like it where they say, well, you're God the Father, God the Son, and they're sitting up in heaven, that's great, but God the Holy Spirit, he's the real deal. That's all we need to worry about right now. And we're preaching the Spirit and we're seeking the Spirit and it's all about the Holy Spirit. And that really, that, that emphasizes something that really, it, it, if, it, it's not pract- if it doesn't just smell like modalism, it's practically modalism. And we want to not fall into that ditch. We looked at that a lot last week. Chasing his gifts rather than the giver of the gifts. Chasing a mode, uh, a, a, a feeling or a vibe or not even just that, but even the practically, the, the really good stuff, the healings and the, the prophetic and chasing that stuff but forgetting the giver of those things. But on the other side, and sometimes in a response to some of the excesses over there, we go, well, we don't, we don't want to be associated with those guys, uh, the, the practical modalists or the people who, who would seek the, the gifts but not the giver. So we're all about the giver and then forget about the Spirit. Or, or practically it's God, the Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Bible. And that's our real trinity. And uh, as long as we've got the Bible... Do we, we don't, you know, the Spirit, great. Spirit convinces us of sin. We can't say Jesus is Lord apart from empowered by the Holy Spirit. So yes, sh- sure. Um, and, and a guarantee, so the Spirit's with us, but that's basically it. And Spirit, don't do anything else. Don't be anything else because we don't want to look be like those guys. Or there's another kind of ditch which goes where well, the Holy Spirit is kind of like an impersonal force. And if we... Like God, the, God is God the Father and God the Son. And in a sense, the Spirit, yeah, okay, we don't want to go against the creeds who say that the Spirit is God, but we don't treat Him as a Him. We treat Him as an it. Kind of like if you've ever been a computer game, gamer and you've got like mana or like a, 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 a kind of spiritual force that you can tap into or like the Jedi and their force, you can kind of tap into the universe. That's not the God of the Bible. There's, there's, a, there's a errors and foolishness that we tend to kind of like on a balancing board, we kind of, we, we, we fall into one or the other very often. In our response to the creeds, we've been learning over the past month, uh, we've seen some confusion about who is this third member of the Trinity. If we're going to be Trinitarians, if we're going to be like scriptural Christians, we're going to be people of the word, we need to know who is, and and we're people who belong to God and conform to his likeness, people who listen to him and put all of our allegiance, all of our hope in him, we need to know who he is. So today I want to spend a little bit of time looking at how God is God the Holy Spirit and what does he do? And then how do we relate to him? Because some seem pretty clear on, yes, he is God and we know what he does, but then we get confused around how then do we relate to him? Is he just the conduit to God the Father through the Son? And he, he is that, but is he, is he only that? So look at that a bit today as well. So who's the Holy Spirit? We just saw Jesus talking about him. He mentions him a little bit earlier in John 14. He says, the counselor or the advocate or the helper, your version might say, the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. And so we see that he is sent from the Father here. We see he is sent from Jesus in chapter 16. That's what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And we see that he is a he. The Holy Spirit is not a force, not just an immaterial kind of power that we could tap into. And I hear people talk about the Spirit like this often. Th- thankfully, I mean, obviously not you guys, uh, but, but some Christians talk about the Spirit like this. Or they confuse or conflate the Spirit with faith, which they also think is kind of like a, like a force. If I could just like conjure up enough faith or conjure up enough Spirit, then I could do that thing that I want to do or heal that person that I want to heal or overcome that sin, sin that I want to overcome. But he is not a power. He, he has power. He's not a force. He's certainly not something we control as if we could command the Holy Spirit to do things. And I hear people foolishly talking in that kind of sense as well, like, oh, you're going to control God. Good luck with that. No, he's the third person of the triune God who does as he pleases because he's God. And he is pleased to do as the Father and the Son will. He possesses divine attributes. That's how we know he's God. Psalm 137, uh, 139 verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? He is everywhere. He is omnipresent. A characteristic only God possesses. The spirit possesses it because he is God. He performs divine work. So uh, Genesis 1, when the earth was void and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, He's there at creation. He's active throughout the Old Testament, empowering God's chosen people, speaking through His prophets, willing to move them where He wants them to go because He is God. And just as the Spirit brings order out of the chaos of the unformed world, he still does that same work in our lives today, bringing order out of the chaos of our unrepentant, unregenerate hearts. He's still doing this divine work because he is divine, he, because he is God. Again, he alone isn't God, but he is God in the Trinity alone. Scripture directly identifies the Holy Spirit as God. A lot. So 2 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 3, says, We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Again, not the Spirit alone is God, but the Spirit is God alone. Or Acts 5, uh, when Ananias and Sapphira, they come to Peter and uh, they say, we sold some stuff and here's all of the money. And he says, you didn't have to give us all of the money, but you've lied to the Holy Spirit. This is what he says. He says, wasn't it yours while you possessed it? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds? You've not lied to people, but to God. He says, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. You're lying to God. So, so he's, again, he's saying the Holy Spirit is God. Or Jesus even says <clears throat> in his great commission, because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go, or as you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and I will be with you until the end. And so who else? does Jesus elevate into that singular position of God outside of God? Nobody. Only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Only. That's why the Nicene Creed affirms, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Not the Father and the Son and then like down here, the Holy Spirit. Or kind of the Father and then the Son's pretty good and the Holy Spirit does stuff in personal force. But rather 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, co-divine, perfect, holy, of the same essence. Understanding his place in the Trinity helps us honour him appropriately. That's what Jesus says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. This gives us great confidence, actually, that Jesus says, I've got to go. God the Son has got to go, but God the Holy Spirit is coming. What does he do? Why is it better? Why is it better for Jesus to go and the Holy Spirit to come? How can Jesus say that? From a, kind of just a, a, a worldly point of view, for us to think, man, what about having the incarnate God right here with us? Like surely he, he just walks on water, tells the waves to calm down. He, 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 someone comes to him and he's like, oh, wow, you're full of faith. Yeah, what, what you just asked me, I've, I've done it. Go for it. It's done. Daughter dead? Not anymore. Brother dead? Not anymore. <laughs> How could it be true that him not, not being there anymore and someone else coming could be better for us? The Holy Spirit, like we saw in John 14 and 16, He's our advocate, our counsellor, our helper. The, word, the Greek word paraclete, you might have heard of that. Um, helper, counsellor. Not, not as in an assistant, not as in, oh, I can do this all by myself, but if I had a little bit of help, I'd get it done faster or better or I could do more, but rather the, I cannot do this thing. I can't do it. I need help. I don't know what to do. Not counsellor as in, well, I'll go get some counsel. I'll take that under advisement. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your kind suggestions. And now I will go and decide what to do. But rather, counsellor as in, I don't have the expertise. I want to go to the guy who knows everything, who is everywhere. I'll go to that guy and ask him. In fact, I don't need to go to him because he lives in me. He's already here. In any time of struggle, any time of confusion, where things are going wonderfully, we have the spirit of joy in us. When things are frustrating, we have the spirit of patience in us. When things are terrible, we have the spirit of peace in us. When we want to relate to God or to others, we have the spirit of love in us. Like filling us is the language that the scripture uses. Filled. Filled. Full. To the top. To the brink. To the max. We can rely on the Spirit of God. And if we, th- the reason it's so important that we have this proper perspective of Him in His Godness is that we can trust Him in our good times and our bad times. He's not just an impersonal force we've got to tap into. And then it's up to me to tap into the force to try to muster up my will to make the thing happen. But God himself is with you all the time, always. God, God, the Lord. Not impersonal force, not assistant to the, but God himself. This is why the Holy Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. Jesus tells us this. Holy Spirit in you, better than Jesus beside you. That he will convict us of sin, especially the sin of disbelief in Jesus. He'll convict us of righteousness and judgment. He'll help us to live rightly, both in knowing how to live rightly and then the the activity of living rightly. And he'll teach us. So Jesus says, I haven't had time to teach you everything. But the one who will come, he will teach you everything. And he did this wonderfully by providing us with the scriptures and still speaks to us today. How wonderful is God? And then uh, verse 14, Jesus says, and he will glorify me. 
So God is for God. God is for God. We looked at this um, in my discipleship group this week. We talked about um, you know, this word, uh, you know, perichoresis, about the relationship with the Holy Trinity, and this, this uh, choresis, like where we get choreographed from. So I'm not saying that they're dancing together, but they are ordered together. They are mutually giving of themselves to one another in, perf- in perfect relationship from eternity past and will for till eternity future, and they are inviting us into that relationship. How wonderful. How wonderful. The Spirit who lives in us, God Himself, guides us and comforts, comforts us, helps us to read Scripture, helps us to pray, like Paul says, and when you don't, want to, when you don't know what to pray, and you just you might have just a, gro- a groaning of a prayer, or even when you do pray, but you don't pray rightly, but the Spirit kind of translates on the way up and prays what you should have prayed. He's our advocate. Wonderful. Because He is God. He is God. And He's not just a, again, He's not just an impersonal power, but He has power. And He gives us power, power to overcome sin, power to live righteously, power to walk in obedience, power to worship God as He deserves. So God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And so the Holy Spirit in us enables us to worship God how He deserves to be worshipped. He's our refiner. He produces fruit in us. He makes us a tree, a tree that bears love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. He does that in us. And this is why Jesus says it's better that he goes so that he can send the Holy Spirit, Spirit in us. It's better than than Jesus beside us. What does it mean for us? To walk by the Spirit, Paul says in Galatians 5, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. That's what, the, that's what God in us does. Ephesians 5, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. Or a little bit earlier, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by Him for the day of redemption. So God has put His mark on you. First, in you being an image bearer, like you, you are a, you're like a standard, like a flag of God's glory that he's placed in the earth at the right time in the right place for his glory. So you would shine the light of God's uh, image to the world. And we wrecked it. So he comes and he puts his stamp on us of his Holy Spirit. So God himself comes to live with us. He says, you, you're mine. How do we know that? We belong to Him. He is in us, always. The guarantee, the promise of redemption that when Jesus comes again, we will rise with Him with glorified bodies just like His. So that's who the the Spirit is. He's a person, the third person of the the Trinity, God Himself. Distinct person, but ontologically, His essence is the same as the Father and the Son, our advocate, our helper, our counsellor. We know He's God through His divine attributes, His divine work, and being equated with God in Scripture. And now we know how do we relate to Him. We relate to Him as God. We can, we, we can worship God because of Him. And because He's God, we can worship Him. He's not an impersonal force. He's not lesser than. He is God Himself. It's a worship that God... We worship God the Father through our union with the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we worship our Trinity, our triune God together. It is wonderful. And so we we don't need to, we do need to be be concerned that we don't, again, fall into any of those ditches where we highlight one thing and neglect another or out of fear of being those crazy Holy Spirit people that we neglect the Holy Spirit altogether. What we want to do is pursue Him how He has revealed himself, which means we need to know who he is. So this is kind of just, this is just your intro for you now in your discipleship groups and in in your families and by yourself. Uh, Let's become reacquainted with the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing some songs that mention the Holy Spirit as well. And you can with full voice and in the power of the Holy Spirit, 
You can sing these words with full confidence, knowing that you're not doing something wrong, but the Spirit is God and deserving of your praise. Not at the expense of the Father and the Son. Again, we don't want to earn to modalism, but because He is God with the Father and the Son. Let's pray together. And so, Father, thank you for the incredible gift of your Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, not distant deity, impersonal force, but God with us. Help us to honour him and seek him and allow him to do his transformative work in, his, in, in our lives, knowing he was sent by you and the Son. And thank you for these creeds we've been learning about the last couple of weeks. Thank you for faithful servants who have um, attested to the, the definitive answer of how shall we read Scripture? How do we know these things are true? You're so good to us. Holy Spirit, uh, we're sorry for those times we've neglected you or sought your gifts at the expense of seeking you. Please, Spirit, do a work in us. Thank you for what you've already done in gifting us faith, faith to receive the grace that saves us. Thank you for, for living with us. Thank you for making us more like Jesus. Thank you for translating our prayers on the way to the Father so that we ask for what we ought to have asked for. Thank you for the gifts you've given us to serve one another and to bring you glory. Thank you for the fruit you're working in us and through us. And Lord, we want to be people of the Spirit. So we're sorry we're, we've grieved you in the past. Forbid us from doing that again. And help us to worship our triune God, the Father, Son, and, and you, Holy Spirit, in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' holy name we ask. Amen.